So our first guest is uh, Dick Cooper, um, who is a three-time winner of the Dublin Marathon, 1980, 85, and 86, six-time national marathon champion, three-time Olympian, 80, 84, and 88. He's had 21 sub-220 marathons. His PB is 212.19. Again, we'll round it down. Um, he's coached 25 different national champions. He's a retired bank manager and has been a, mem a member of Rohini Shamrocks for over 50 years. So welcome, Dick. Uh, next time, uh, maybe I'll get uh, James. Uh, James Nolan has represented Ireland at 800 and 1500 metres in two Olympics, two world championships, three European championships and six world indoors. He won silver in the 800 metres at the Euro under 23 championships in 1999 mm -hmm. and also silver in the 1500 at Euro indoor in 2000. He's a PB of 335 in the 1500 and 354 in the mile. He is uh, currently working with Paralympics Ireland, where he's head of athletics there and is also coaching a lot of athletes around UCD. So welcome, James. Uh, next, I have uh, Katharina McKiernan. Um, is Katharina here? I see, I see you, yeah. Uh, Katharina is regarded as one of the world's Best ever cross-country runners. Born in County Cavan, she grew up on the family farm and played a lot of sports, sports during her school years before taking up athletics seriously in the late 1980s. Her first success came in 1988 when she won the Irish school's cross-country title. From there, her career as a cross-country runner blossomed. She won silver in the cross-country championships four years in succession from 92 to 95. In 94, she won the inaugural European cross-country title. And in 92 and 96, she represented Ireland at the Olympic Games. In 97, she decided she'd kind of go into semi-retirement and moved up to the marathon. Um, she has won the Berlin, London and Amsterdam marathons. And I think it was in Amsterdam that you set the current, still the current Irish marathon record of 2.23.44. No? no? Oh! <laughs> well, you're... You're doing yourself a disservice because that came from your email. To, to <laughs> and then last but by no means least, we have uh, Emmett Dunleavy. I knew, just see Emmett, I was, yeah, I saw you were not at the edge of, of a row. <laughs> you were actually first on my list to call up. Uh, Emmett has coached hundreds of runners since establishing perfect pacing in 2014. He's an Athletics Ireland level two qualified endurance coach. And he has managed a lot of Irish teams and athletes at international level. He's currently coaching a wide variety of athletes and groups from recreational to professional. He can be seen in Belfield on many nights and where he has a very, very large following. Uh, some of his current roles include endurance coach with UCD, Bell Park Triathlon and Kilcool. And I hope that's correct. I got that from the internet, so it has to be right. Well, welcome. So I guess this is the part of the day where um, I would hope that we have a lot of questions from the audience, but I might kick it off if I can start. Um, and I know that some of you have been here for the whole day and some of you have arrived as the day has gone on. But um, I think uh, maybe um, Emmett and James, you, you've been here, I think, most of the day. Just are there any things you've heard that kind of struck a chord with you or resonated with you compared to your own experience, you know, is either in, in at either competing or in coaching? Um, yeah, I suppose a lot of the focus, which is, you know, was great is, is on the running itself, um, which, you know, when we go out to run, we can probably only do about two hours of, of quality running a day. I suppose really interested, you know, the other 22 hours of the day determine how good that two hours can be. Um, so, you know, really sort of analyzing what you do in the other 22 hours is, 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 is as, if not more important than the two hours you spend analyzing the training. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that somebody else mentioned earlier on about, you know, the, the, the fact that full-time athletes can really focus on that, but an awful lot of, you know, people who are not, who are recreational athletes, or I don't know if the, the phrase recreational even counts because who isn't obsessed with running, you know, you're not recreational. 
um, you're an obsessed but sub elite athlete. But you know, there's all sorts of life pressures to deal with, um, which means recovery can be very difficult. Um, is there anything that you? Yeah, I suppose um, one of the things that struck a chord coming from the coaching background was uh, Ashling's presentation and that continuum of injury from running smoothly up to you know very serious injuries and how far up that continuum it was before they consulted a coach was probably a little bit of a concern. But um, I suppose looking at um, you know all of the information that we've got today, I suppose it's important to come at these things from that coaching and athletics is both an art and a science. And we've got an awful lot of the, the science side of things today. And it's a case of combining that with, you know, your own intuition and, and breaking things down to an individual basis and combining those because we can look at big data, but it's also important to keep in mind that we're all very much different as individuals as well. So, trying to find a happy medium between the two yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um i'll maybe ask a couple more questions um uh, maybe katrina i'm particularly interested and somebody mentioned during the week about you know the, the similarities between the middle distance and the long distance when you did make that transition from moving from running the shorter distances and i don't i guess they weren't really short distances but when you moved up to the marathon what kind of changes did you make in your in your approach or your training? Uh, well, actually, it was easier for me to run the longer distances than the short distance. I suppose from I started running um, or competing at 18 years of age. Um, my coach, Joe Doonan, was very scientific and I suppose wanted everything to be right. And um, I went to Trinity to get tested on the treadmill with Professor Myra O'Brien and Bernard Dunn. And that very evening that I went, uh, the test that they did, they said that it was made for the long haul. So, but I was only, whatever, 18 at that stage. So, you know, I needed to build up endurance and I needed, had a lot of work to do. So that meant running shorter distances. And in actual fact, you know, those uh, World Cross Country Championships, European Championships, they were only six, 6K. So that was really hard work for me because they were very short. And it meant me working at a pace that I wasn't comfortable at. So I suppose to answer your question, when I did move up to running the marathons, um, I was at a comfortable pace. Uh, the only thing that changed was the distance got longer, obviously, and the pace got a little bit slower and a little bit more comfortable. I was cruising at, at that pace and I always worked under heart rate. Um, I feel that people who are training without heart rate training are running a little bit blind. And I had three different zones that I trained at. And in actual fact, the most important one was my easy runs because I had a tendency to want to, you know, want to achieve, wanted to do good and uh, be the best that I possibly could. But in actual fact, easy running has a lot of benefits. And um, my easy heart rate was 130, 135. And um, it's important to run easy because then for me in particular, I was rested enough then to run on the days that I was meant to run hard. And that's a mistake that a lot of people make is to run too fast on their easy days. And then they're not rested enough and therefore not able to get the progression in their training. Okay, great. And I've one question, if anybody wants to ask a question, stick your hand up. I have one question for you, Dick, it's always intrigued me. I mean, I watched um, on YouTube not so long ago the, the video of the 1984 marathon, and it, it just seems to have been an amazingly uncomfortable and intense experience in terms of the heat and the environmental conditions. And, you know, maybe I'd be interested in your perspective looking back on it when you compare running the Dublin Marathon in October and running in different environments like that, you know, how much of, like, because performance wise, you, you were able to maintain the performance, but how much more does it take out of you when you're in those environments? Generally, I know anybody who's watched the championship marathons over the years, they're invariably on hot, in hot countries on tough courses. Uh, and the times that are recorded in those championship marathons are, are, are not commensurate with what you'll, find from Berlin and London and Chicago and these places probably be four or five minutes down but they're they're true they're true championship races the Los Angeles or the Los Angeles one you ask about was actually at five o'clock in the evening people seem to have forgotten that and it finished in the dark um, it was still very hot but the actual burning sun um, wasn't um, wasn't as prevalent I suppose on the day so 
you know, it, it, it produced a result that obviously thrilled Ireland. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm the third part of that quiz question. Um, we, we had three Irish runners in, in uh, Los Angeles. John Tracy got the silver medal. The great Jerry ran ninth. I was there as well. <laughs> I picked that day to, to, to uh, run poorly, which always haunts me. So thanks very much for asking the question. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, though, as I was um, looking, at, I, I'm not here that long. I got the last hour of it. I got the bit mostly on the wall there that you were talking about. And for anyone um, who's running in the marathon and has particular interest in it, my theory on, on that is that when you're training for it, the most important session that you do in the week is your long run. And your long run has two benefits. One, it's educating the body to deal with fatigue. And two, it's educating the mind to deal with the time that you're going to be out there. It's very, very hard when you're a newbie to get used to being out there for two, three, four hours and occupy, occupying your mind. And that little negative fella, he, he comes very early in those runs. Sometimes he wants you stopping after four or five miles and you feel worse after four or five miles than you do at 20 miles. Um, but that's, uh, it, that can only be dealt with by regular practice and regular just doing it. Um, so that is the most important thing. The tempo sessions, the speed sessions, they are, of course, very important, but they, they, are, they won't get you there. Um, they won't get you to the finish line. They'll get you there faster if you're doing the other stuff properly. But the most important thing is the long run. So I can't emphasize that enough. I think somebody mentioned, did they have to do a 30K run to be sure that they could finish, was it? Was something like something to do with that? Well, I would be sort of, what would you say, negative about that kind of an attitude. You need to do the long runs. You need to do them regularly. Educate the mind and the body. Brilliant. Thanks. We have a question from the audience here. Hi. Um, my question is actually about the open for the long run. So, me, the challenge I think is my long run for the long run. I'm here and I'm just going to do a quick and I'll be comfortable having you about how to talk to yourself out of and then it's going to be laid off the like a long training run or is it? It's, it is, a lot of it is in the mind, really, really. And I suppose during my career, there was different stages that really made me think that more, you know, maybe, I, I'll not say percentage wise, but you have to have the right mindset for training and for for competition. Um, it's not always the fittest athlete that wins the race. It's the one that has the strongest mindset. And um, I have a nice little saying that I share with people usually is my mind is a garden. My thoughts are seeds. I can grow flowers or I can grow weeds. So that'll even take up five or 10 minutes of your of your run. So <laughs> and, and, and even if you even if you keep repeating that, but just, you know, to understand how important your mindset is, how important it is to feed it positive thoughts. And to, as Dick said, they're not to let those that little person come in and, and, and distract you. Um, you know, get things like for me during when I was competing, I was very lucky in that I had a lot of support from home in Cavan. Um, I was allowed run on the on Cavan golf course, um, which was great because it was all up and down hills. And then when I would go to a cross country race in the likes of France or Belgium or Spain or wherever it was, it was totally flat. flat. So, Instantly, I thought, OK, I'm so used to running up and down hills that, you know, I can win this very easily. And it did feel easy because of the strength that I had from running up and down hills. So you're always there trying to find the positives rather than feeding the negatives. Um, then, you know, as I said, the support at home, uh, family support. Um, another little story that I often tell as well, you know, on a Sunday morning, it was I grew up in a very, very rural part of the country and um you know, there wasn't a lot to do, actually only run around the fields on the family farm. And I'm the youngest of seven, so it was a, a great way to get away from the mall. But, um, you know, the priest on a Sunday morning when I was running a race would say a prayer for me uh, off the altar and everybody would join in. So, you know, when, when the legs were hanging off me with a kilometre or whatever, a mile to go, these were the sort of things that I thought about. Um, 
uh, that got me to the finish line. Uh, they were really a strong, very, very, very strong driving force. And I'm sure you all have things that you can distract yourself with that will drive you to the to the finish line. And I suppose the most important thing I will say on that is to realize how negative, you know, how the negative thoughts, how detrimental they can be to your performance and not to entertain them. And they're only thoughts. They're not, they're not real. And I think if we can get that point across to you all that the mind plays such a big, big part. And, you know, when, when they do come in, just accept them, but don't let them take from your performance and practice it in training and just get out there in all kinds of weather. We, never, we don't have extreme weather here at all. Get out and enjoy the sun in your face, enjoy the rain in your face, enjoy the hailstones in your face and just get out and get out and do it because, um, you know, and, and everybody has different standards, different um, focuses, but the most important thing is to get the most out of yourself, whatever that standard is. And the joy is in the journey. Thank you. I'm just, um, I just have a question. Owen, do you, do you want to go? Yeah, thanks very much. I'm going to this question here. It's just asking you, so it's just by uh, King's point of view, the physiological happiness that would be too nice in the long run. So maybe uh, the philosophical question is, do you think that uh, our top marathon winners are born or are they never do their training to move to the ones that are supposed to? And is there an argument potentially made for the talent ID for the marathon? Certainly, that your marathon record has been around for quite a while. It's also a uh, record that was around for a long time ago, so last night. Are some, is there possible that some of athletes are taking the marathon too late in life? And that maybe if they're identified earlier, they want to stand with their be a little bit. Well, I, I won't answer that last part of the question because. <laughs> I can't, um, you know, everybody has a choice in what they do and I can't, you know, that's th that's their plan. Uh, but, you know, obviously you need to have talent, not with marathon, but with any distance in running, you need to have, have talent. But as the saying goes, hard work beats talent when talent won't work hard. So there's no point in having the talent if you don't put in the in the hard work. And there's no doubt about it. It is it is a commitment. There's a lot of dedication. There's a lot of different aspects to it. But I would say to try and keep things simple. I think over the years with all of the technology that things have got a little bit too complicated. At the end of the day, you just have to get out that door and do the miles and do the work. And you have to enjoy it. Um, if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to perform as well you're not going to get the most out of yourself and I just loved running by myself I had no you know nobody else to run with and that that you know I knew no better and that didn't bother me and I think you know if you want anything in any sport or in any walk of life if you want it badly enough you will work at it and uh, make no excuses that's the key make no excuses and get the most out of yourself do it other coaches have any, any perspective on that? That's an inter that was a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, talent identification is an interesting one. Uh, certainly in the marathon in Ireland, um, after the 80s, particularly in the men, Katrina's era was a little bit after ours, and uh, she kept the women's going up to the sort of the late 90s. Um, but after that, there was a, a ferocious drop off of people um, venturing into the marathon. And these would be people who should have been. Uh, trying it. I personally have a view that it coincided with the Celtic Tiger and people were too busy making money and their bosses wouldn't let them train enough and you know there was a lot of that kind of stuff in it and I'm serious about that. Um, if you look at the history of running and mass running and everything like that it tends to be when times are a bit down that the numbers surge um, and during the we had a surge in the 80s the Celtic Tiger came along and everything dropped or we nearly lost the Dublin Marathon during it um uh, and then lo and behold the running boom came again but our more most talented runners i think of fellas like peter matthews and seamus power and those kind of guys they were superb runners and they should have gone to the marathon in their mid to late 20s but they left it as an afterthought and by the time they got there it was too late because they never viewed themselves properly as having a career path um there um then we formed a thing called Marathon Mission and out of Marathon Mission, first of all, 
we had a situation for a lot of years where nobody was qualifying then for major games. Nobody at all. Um, I think Martin Fagan in, in 96, was it? Was it in 96? Uh, or was it that late? Yeah, he, he qualified, but and Pauline Curley got there at some stage. But there was virtually nobody qualifying. Whereas now we're back to a situation where there, we, invariably we have three people uh, on each team. It's beginning to sag again, and there's a bit of a worry. If you look at our more dominant uh, men and women, um, the, 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 the performance graph is dropping. But then we have a plethora of young athletes coming through. Um, our juniors, our under 23s and all that kind of stuff. I only hope that their coaches won't delay it too long. I see a young man, man called Ephraim Gide. And if you ask me, he's going to be the next Irish record holder for the, for the marathon. But he's only 21. But I hope he doesn't leave it too late. You know, if he gets there by the time he's about 25, 26. If you look at a lot of the Olympic champions, a lot of the world champions, they're pretty young. They're 24, they're 25, they're 26. They're not, they're not old guys now in their 30s or old ones in their whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, stop, stop. <laughs> Coach Dunleavy, do you have a view on this? Yeah, I suppose purely from a, a physiological point of view, your first part of the question was, there, are they born or are they made? And to a large extent, marathon runners are, are born. Um, a lot of the, the attributes can be changed and tinkered with and improved over the years, but... Um, I suppose even if you were to go down the road of physiologically testing uh, the likes of Katrina or Dick, they, the results would point towards them being a marathon runner. But even if you look at the profile of them, as the distances go up, these type of athletes tend to come into their own as they're not particularly quick over 800, 1500 metres. And you figure out even as a coach or as an athlete over the years that these guys are ultimately made towards the marathon. And I think... Um, a challenge as coaches and as a nation as well is, is identifying the one the athletes at the moment. We've got a huge, we've got, you know, we're spoiled with the amount of underage talent that we've got coming through. It's a case of, you know, identifying the athletes that are most likely going to be our best marathon runners in, the, in a few years' time. And as Dick says, not being afraid to actually move them up early, um, that they're not spending the majority of their 20s doing short stuff when ultimately where they're actually going to be better is, is at the longer stuff. And we've had a, a huge increase in standards in the marathon on both men's and women's side over the last sort of five, six, seven years. Um, there's a little bit more depth there. I suppose what we want to come along now is, is that once in a generation athlete like Katrina that will you know move the bar, not just at an Irish level, but at an international level. Um, and I think if, you're, if we've got a nice wide pool of talent, which we do, they're well looked after, then when the, the, the next Katrina McKernan comes along, we're in a good position to help them to, to realise their full potential at international level and hopefully see some more medals come along. Right. You never thought about moving up, James? Indeed, I suppose it's a good it's a good point, not just for the marathon, but there's opportunities, I feel, in, in other events. So a lot of guys, I, I just start throwing out times here. I hope you understand them. So if you're running sort of 335 to 340 for 1500, you sort of get excited and you might qualify for the Olympics, but that's it. You're not going to do anything else. So should you move up to the steeplechase? Should you, you know, should you be looking at 5Ks? Can you progress to an Olympic final instead of just getting knocked out of the first round? So uh, Owen asked a question there about talent ID and development. There's not really a structured talent ID and development system in, in Ireland that I'm aware of. Um, there are other tests we could do in speed and power and jump tests as well for, for different disciplines, long jump, triple jump. And, and maybe we should be we should be looking at that. Yeah. 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 I think other countries have benefited from it. Um, Lorraine, we maybe leave the last question with you because I know the, the panel have places to be. Sorry, my very basic question after that. Very profound one. But um, it was just for amateurs, any advice on fueling during the marathon other than take a few gels during their long runs before and see how it goes? doesn't sound like it a comes down to everything. It's practice. Um, I come from an era where we didn't eat anything during a marathon. We wouldn't go near a gel. And in fact, to this day, I've never had a gel. I don't know if you've ever had one, Mort. Um, I see I see them selling all right. Um, but that's not to diminish the, the, the effect of them and, and the importance of them. Maybe I would have been faster or better if I, if I had used them. I also came from an era where we wouldn't drink water except uh, our water or any fluid except in a race my theory was that if i didn't drink any water during training so i would do up to 30 miles and i wouldn't take a drop uh, and my theory was well camels go across deserts without 
without a drink so that when when races when race day came along it was a bonus to get a a, a drink so um i was also innovative then um when i came along in that i i started to drink tea during the uh, uh i took tr tree uh, uh, tea as my preferred drink during a marathon and my theory was there well what do you do at 11 o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the afternoon you, when you want a little boost you want something like a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. C a coffee just wasn't on my horizon at, at that stage. So I, I made tea, very lightly sugared, and I suppose in that way I was fueling. But that was kind of back in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Um, and I see people, I, I tell you what really galls me, when I see somebody going out for a 5K run and they're gripping a bottle and they have a belt around them and they have all this stuff, and I say... They're going to put on weight. Uh, um, and I don't want to be, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to be smart or cynical or that, but, um, and to get back to your question, I think you need to teach yourself what works for you, because obviously these gels have a, have the risk of making you sick, uh, which is the last thing you want. Um, you know, you see them handing out boils or sweets during the race and oranges and stuff like that. Whatever you take on board, if you decide... Uh, make sure that it's palatable and that you can take it. Now, I do appreciate that if somebody is out for four hours or five hours, they're out for a way longer than uh, an elite athlete is out for their two hours, 10 or 20 or 30. Um, so there is a, a, a more important fueling factor there, probably. Uh, the interesting thing, getting back to the wall then, is that the biggest dropout race in, in these city marathons is actually... Uh, amongst the elite runners because the elite runners are gambling with their pace a lot of the time. So I, th I think the general statistics say, for example, the Dublin Marathon is about 96% of those who actually start the race will finish and the highest um, ratio of dropouts will be among the, the elites who are gambling on winning or getting a high placing or getting that time or whatever. So if you've paced yourself right, you'll get through it. Um, so the fueling then is important. But what I would say to you is just make sure you've got your fueling right um, and then punish yourself a bit in training so that on race day, whatever you're getting, whether it's your mother turning up at 20 miles with, with a gel or whatever, that that's a bonus that you don't give yourself on training day so that you know that because race day, you're going to be going a bit faster. You're going to be caught up in the, the adrenaline of it all. Suck in those bonuses, you know. Uh, don't take on too much water because sometimes people obsess over taking in too much water and they, they, they waterlog, they have too much water on themselves, which actually affects performance as well. Um, so there's a balance, like life, there's a balance in everything. I know there are other questions. I did see some hands going up, but we are over time. And I think to be fair to the people who've come here and given us their time, we, we better let them go home and have the next part of their day. Um, and have you have the next part of your day. So listen, thank you very much to the panel. I really appreciate your time.